What's up, CHFFL, and welcome to round two of the 2022 playoffs. We're not live this week. I am coming up to Pittsburgh for the holidays, so I'm shooting this video Thursday morning. I'm hoping to have it to you before the Thursday game, because my predictions obviously don't have the benefit of the Thursday game this week. Uh, by the way, we've been live for a while, so why don't you help me out with something? First of all, go ahead right now and like this video so that I can have a really high self-esteem on Christmas morning. And uh, when this video is done, leave a comment on which method you prefer. Do you like the live stream or the pre-recorded? But let me give this a shot first so you have a recent sample in mind. For round one, I was correct to be scared. If Josh Allen had met his projection, Bill and I would have been in a dead tie down to the fraction. But he didn't. He scored... 14 points over his projection, and thank you, Josh Allen. Hopefully you can deliver us another one in round two. Swan absolutely exploded at the perfect time, got his highest score of the year in round one of the playoffs, even without Lamar Jackson. What a great feeling that must be for him. Bannis and Jason put together a great team. I really like them this year. Unfortunately, they are out. The good news is that Bannis won't be able to pick the conference theme this year, so looking on the bright side of life. And the big thing we're watching this week is Grant with the Jalen Hurts saga. Bear in mind, I made these slides Wednesday night, and I'm doing this Thursday morning, so new information may be coming out, but it's a big question for him. What's he going to do at quarterback in the semifinals this week? Waiver report. Marty added Zach Moss for $15 after Jonathan Taylor went down. And I know I lost Jonathan Taylor. I'm not starting Zach Moss, or I don't even remember the other guy. Marty's got both of them. A good pickup for him. Could be a waiver fill-in these last couple rounds of the loser's bracket. I added a pair of players. One, the Bucks D for $10, and then Daniel Jones, Danny Dimes for 8 these were both in anticipation that there's a 50% chance I will play Grant in week 17, either in the third place game or in the championship. I think personally Hertz may miss a couple of weeks with his shoulder, even though they're keeping optimism that he will play this week. And Daniel Jones is by far the best streamer, in my opinion, available on waivers. And then uh, for the Bucks D, they play... I think Arizona and Trace McSorley this week. I'm, I hope they do badly this week. Go Trace. But they play Carolina in Week 17, and I think that's one of the best matchups still available. Grant added the Titans defense for $2, considered one of the best streamers this week, but they play Dallas in Week 17, and if Grant wants to start them against me, he is free to do so. But I am surprised that Grant got the Titans defense, one of the top streaming options this week for only two dollars at the end of the year so what happened to allow him to get that parker's the biggest question mark for me is 21 dollars in faab left and his current defense is pittsburgh versus las vegas which is fine i think the titans this week i forget who they're playing but it's a good matchup would be better and i'm just perplexed at why parker left them on the board marty would also really like the Titans, but he's out of budget. Wes and Stan, I guess, are good with the Jets in San Francisco. San Francisco is a great start this week. Jets, the Jaguars look really good right now, but they're a good defense, so Wes might be in a start-your-stud kind of position. And Swan, I'm sure, would have liked to have kept Grant from getting a good defense, but he's just overloaded with players and doesn't have anyone to drop. Otherwise, I didn't look at the teams that are on by... Personally, if I was even in the loser's bracket on a buy, I would be spite picking up players that I think others could have. But anyway, all of that series of coincidences let Grant get a good defense this week. Week 17 on defense is going to be very sparse, though. Looking at who's available on free agency, I don't think Grant's going to want to start the Titans against Dallas. Uh, Jags versus Houston... And the Chargers versus the Rams, those aren't great defenses, but they're considered great teams to stream against. We just saw Marty stream the Packers against the Rams, and it worked out very well for him, even though the Packers aren't considered a great fantasy defense. But other than these two teams, that's about it. And these teams on by that didn't pick anybody up this week, a lot of people are going to be going at defenses. So I'm happy to be hoarding three 
that all have good Week 17 matchups. All right, let's get into this round's predictions. In round one, I went 3-1, and one, bringing me to 61-27 and 27 on the season. My lone miss was that I picked Mini to be over Marty, and that was such a close game. Came down to less than a point, or right about therein, and it could have gone either way. Good game from both teams. Mini now faces the prospect of being the loser of the year. Otherwise, I got our three playoff matchups correct. Swan was the team of the week. I advanced. I, I think I had considered Swan versus Bannis to be the game of the week. It doesn't matter too much in the playoffs. Both playoff games are going to be about equal. And Parker and Marty picked up wins in the loser's bracket to avoid that dreaded 12th place finish. We'll start in the loser's bracket here. Marty's thrusters versus Stan's grabber by the Pelosi. ESPN has Stan favored 111.5 to 101 right now. Fantasy Pros has this as a really close game. Only Stan up 81 to 80. Marty coming off that nail biter with Mini. Stan coming off a bye week. Marty needs a defense special teams and missed on the Titans because he didn't have FAAB, but he's not going to want to roll with the Packers again this week, I don't think. Is Jarek McKinnon the loser's bracket winner? So last week I expressed skepticism, thinking that McKinnon might disappear and then come back and disappear and come back but now it's now been three solid weeks in a row and two big boom games in a row I think you have to let that hot hand ride and which Taylor backup does Marty go with Zach Moss seemed to get the carries this past week and do you trust I guess he he's in a spot where he has to I just if the Colts were holding Jonathan Taylor back I don't think their backup is, that his backup is going to be great but if you need someone, I think there's a bit of a question there on who you start. Stan, I just look at Stan's team, and it seems such like a, a possible playoff team, not a loser's bracket team. It, and it's averaging eight points higher, the lineup that he had when I looked at this, than ESPN was projecting it. I think that projection is low based off of maybe a bad week last week. And I am curious if Sutton is healthy, if he squeaks into Stan's lineup. But my prediction here is Stan. I just like, I like a lot of his matchups. Pollard at Philadelphia is tough, but I think Stan can put up a really nice score this week. This is nothing against Marty's team. Next, Schindler's Fist, Parker versus Wes's Pokeballs and Pussycats. ESPN has, that's definitely reversed. Wes favored 123.6 to 95.8 and a big gap on Fantasy Pros as well, 89 to 74. Parker did avoid last place this week, but Wes looks like he's a little overpowered in the loser's bracket right now, week to week, just so much higher than the other guys on Fantasy Pros. Parker is, still has the Sean Watson in his starting lineup, waiting on him to have a good fantasy game, which he has not really done yet. Karma. Pacheco. With Jarek McKinnon going off, has Pacheco lost some of his role? I don't think so. I think the Chiefs' offense is great, and they have room for two backs, and they have distinct roles. But it might be eating into his upside a little bit. And is Gabe Davis due? We haven't talked about Gabe Davis in a while, and that's because Gabe Davis hasn't done anything in a while worth talking about. But we know that, for some reason, on some games, Josh Allen locks onto him, and he'll get 40 points. That's really the, the way that I see Parker potentially winning this game is that we've started to sleep on Davis and now it finally happens. For Wes, Ramondre returned from injury big time. There was that horrible debacle at the end of the game, but I blame Jacoby Myers much more than Ramondre for that. Chris Godwin seems to be immune to the Buccaneers' struggles. He's going to get his targets, he's going to get his catches, and a score gives him a good score for the day. Is uh, George Pickens going to be happy to have Kenny back? I think so. There's the been all this discussion about the Steelers and favoritism between Mitch and Kenny, who they like to throw to. But I think that could be a good boost for Pickens. Prediction is Wes. Yeah, I don't see that one being close. Now, let's get into our real playoff games. Swans. Jackson, my cook, Goff versus Grant's team with Hertz, maybe? Series history here. This was brought up on the Two Tight Ends podcast, which I always recommend that you go and listen to. What does the series history look like, particularly with our next game? But I wanted to see for both. In the regular season, CHFFL history, Grant and Swan have split their matchups 13 13. These are two teams that have seen a lot of each other. And in the postseason, Grant is getting the better of Swan. He's won the last three 
postseason games between these two three and one series overall all time. ESPN has swan up 132 to 123.2 on their pro- their projections whenever I made these slides. But of course, that means Grant, Grant at that point had no quarterback or kicker. You figure even if he has Min- Minshew or some other streamer in there and a kicker is going to have six or seven points projection, Grant's going to be projected around 145. No matter who, no matter what choices he ends up making. Fantasy Pros has this as a similar spread, Swan at a 95, Grant at an 86. How do you project the quarterback situation? I don't know. I'm honestly hypothetical. I just, I don't know. I don't think Hertz is going to play. So does Grant start Minshew against a Dallas defense that has been good on the year, struggling the past couple of weeks, but I still think that they're a solid defense. Swan is the hottest team in the league, coming off a 180-point week. This is a good, this is a good, fun matchup. Swan hopes for Lamar Jackson to be back, because remember, he's not quite a full strength, but he's good with Goff. Goff has had a lot of waiver money spent on him by different teams this year, and Swan seems to have finally settled on, nah, this is a guy who should stay on a team and not be go in between waivers, free agency, and being rostered. (laughs) Since making my $5 bet with Parker that Buffalo will beat their 4.1 projection, ESPN revised the projection to being over 5. Our bet was still made when it was 4.1, though. So that's good. I still think having them projected at 5-something is ridiculous. This is the best defense to start this week against Chicago, and they're projected something like 20th out of defenses it's absurd tight end big advantage i think not maybe not big but there is an advantage for swan with kittle i don't think he's gonna even consider starting goddard the first week off the injury with maybe Minshew and against dallas so it's gonna be kittle who just had a good week grant has waller healthy now and he activated him i think he might be starting waller it's possible that grant feels this week pain for going all in but not really getting the tight end. We'll see. If Kittle has a big score, that's something that I imagine is going to be discussed quite a bit. Kenneth Walker III is back, so Swan actually stronger than he was last week when he put up over 180. Grant, it's all about the quarterback, and I've talked about it enough at this point that I don't need to on this slide. And is he going to start Waller and Najoku? I think he's going to end up starting Waller. Grant... I won't call it chasing points, but Grant goes with the hot hand, and Waller had a better game last week. Grant is still a powerhouse at the flex spots, though. It's absurd looking at rankings for the week, running back and wide receiver, and flex. Grant is still ahead of Swan. No matter what the score ends up being this week, Grant is the more powerful team at the positions that matter. It's the disadvantages at tight end, quarterback, maybe defense. One, one thing I just think is so interesting here, still has his board intact. Grant went all in. Swan only traded an eighth round pick for Kittle. Otherwise, these are all just guys he's drafted or picked up. It's a coin flip. It's a coin flip. Swan is projected low, just like I thought Stan was. He projected 10 points under his average. I think that's really disrespectful. I mean, I've already talked about Buffalo's defense, but there are points otherwise that he's missing in ESPN's projection. So I, I think a good projection for both of them would be around 145 to 150. And looking at all the totality of the situation, my prediction is Swan. I think Swan breaks his three-game playoff l- losing streak to Grant. I think he advances to the championship with a full draft board, which is incredibly impressive how... After not having a lot of success in the early years of the CHFFL, Swan has really turned it around since we started doing keepers. Kudos to him, and I think he picks up the win this week. I think it'll be really close. Great game. I I like Swan a little better. Moving over to my Atlanta Pipe Burst versus Mark's Lady G's Beard. And this is where Grant brought up on two tight ends that you can almost call this a rivalry, and that made me scratch my head a little bit. I said I don't think of Mark specifically as a rival the way I think of Grant. And looking at the the 
series history, I see why I thought that, but I also see why Grant thought how he does. We haven't met a lot. A lot of how many times you've played somebody has to do with our original conferences, which were the same for the first eight or so years. In the regular season, Mark has gotten the better of me, winning seven games to my five. The big th reason why I think Grant sees this as a rivalry is that there have been a lot of historical games in this matchup between me and Mark. I've won two postseason games, and he's won three. But in within those five games that we've played in the postseason, there were two championships. We each won one. And there were two third-place games where we each got a victory the same way. So when we have met, it has been impactful, and this one is to no doubt about that. ESPN has me projected at 145.5 and Mark at 126.5. Fantasy Pros favors me 100 to 89. These are the preseason favorites, right? For this conference. Thought it was going to be me and then Mark. Mark actually ended up winning in the regular season, getting the first round by, but we meet here anyway. It's a little sad that we're both kind of missing our captains. I'm missing number one overall pick, Jonathan Taylor, and he's missing Cooper Cup but we've still managed to make it here. I have good matchups this week. That makes me feel really nice, even though I'm, I'm trying to look past not having Jonathan Taylor. Ravens defense against rookie Desmond Ritter makes me feel very good. But with Taylor out, who's going to be the flex? Christian Watson, Michael Pittman, Derek and I have been going back and forth, and now Pittman has a different quarterback throwing to him. It's going to be tough, but we have six Saturday players. Mark has seven. No Thursday players, so a lot of this is going to be decided Christmas Eve before we have to make that decision in the flex. Looking at Mark, he's got these running back and flex choices too that are going to be tough. Zeke, tough matchup with Philadelphia. Miles Sanders on the other side of that same game, a tough matchup with Dallas. Potentially a new quarterback, does that hurt the offense as a whole? Do we trust Swift yet? I don't have him in my starting lineup for the Dynasty semifinals. Trust Devonta Smith with Gardner Minshew potentially throwing? These are tough for Mark, too, and he's going to have to pick uh, two or three of those guys. Kamara, Chase, Waddle. Those are your sure starts, and then, yeah, he needs two of these four. What is the difference going to be between Pat Fryermuth and Travis Kelsey? Fryermuth can't have another zero and Mark win this game, and I don't think he's going to put up a, an actual dud again. Got Kenny coming back in. Don't know how that's going to change things for the tight end. And then Denver's defense at the Rams, I just have to say, good on Mark. Sometimes you see somebody else get frustrated with a player who has value, and that's what Mark capitalized on here. Because I had Denver's defense, they had three or so good matchups in a row where they just scored very badly. And I, I said, when I was a guest on the Two Tight Ends podcast, I got to get rid of them. The offense is so bad that it doesn't let the defense be good. Then Mark picked them up, and they've, they've just been scoring well since then. Going against Baker and the Rams is a very good matchup. So even though I feel very confident in the Ravens' D against Ritter, Mark has gone out and at least met me about even there. I think this matchup is going to come down to Monday night, where I will have Austin Eckler, and Keenan Allen, and maybe Michael Pittman playing. It's going to be a matchup for the ages. I'm very excited about this. And my prediction, Grant made me feel better about this with their guesses on the two tight ends, but I have to take myself, using his words, have to be confident, have to show the team confidence, picking myself, I think it's going to be a great game. Thanks for watching, everybody. Remember, go comment. Do you like this style better, or do you want me to go back to the live streams? Live streams aren't going away because they're so much easier. Remember... Never look an opportunity to take your Thursday players out of your flex in the mouth. That includes Saturday players. Merry Christmas, everybody. We'll see you next time.